Welcome back to the Bible Challenge. This is session two. I'm so excited to be going through this stuff with you. It's life-changing when you realize the power of the Bible in your life. And my prayer and hope and wish is that you're going to start building your life on the foundation of something that's so unshakable, so unchangeable, so unbreakable. It's just going to make a huge difference in your life starting right now. Now, the question we're answering today really is, how did we get the Bible? I mean, it, it's kind of weird. Like you think about it, I've got a German Bible right here. I've got a Norwegian Bible right here that I introduced you to yesterday. Again, if you didn't see that one, this is uh, my great grandfather bought, brought this over from Norway through Ellis Island. And I am the, I'm the keeper of this amazing treasure. I have a Swahili Bible right here. I have a Greek Bible right here. I have a humongous old English Bible right here from the mid-1800s. I mean, how did we end up with these things? Because if you think about it, probably at one point these things were on scrolls, right? How did we get from there to here? We're going to be talking about that. I want to um, kind of share one big thought as we get started, and that is this. The Bible is really a communication from God to you and me, and that's the thing, one of the things that sets God apart uh, from all the other belief systems that are out there about different gods and, and all that. The God of the Bible speaks. That's the interesting thing. He speaks, and that's what he's done in this word of God that we now have the privilege, the extreme privilege. I mean, people have given their lives so that you and I could have the Word of God. So I want to share with you how we got the Bible. Um, and really, it started out in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, when God said, let there be light. This is the thing. God speaks, right? He creates life through words. He creates direction, vision through words, instruction through words. And that's exactly what God did when he um, uttered the words of the Bible and he, he guided the words of the Bible. We're talking all about that in this session, also Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, it says, After the victory, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it aloud to Joshua. I mean, God's been in the business of recording words for human instruction for thousands and thousands of years. And um, and so I think it's just one big thought for you and me to have. It's like, yeah, God speaks and he has spoken to us through his word. And we have the amazing privilege of holding it in our hands, asking him to put it into our hearts, because that's what really makes a difference. And that's why we're doing this whole thing called the Bible Challenge in the first place. So I want to move on to the first real question uh, behind the question, which is who wrote it? I mean, how did we get this thing? I've got all these different versions and languages and translations. And who wrote this thing? And so I want to kind of back up a little bit and talk about something called the three eyes of Scripture. That would be the inspiration the inerrancy and the infallibility of the Bible. So inspiration means it's God breathed. I'm going to unpack that in just a second. That God actually breathed the words of Scripture. We'll look at what that means. Inerrancy means that um, it is it, without error. That um, Now, when you think about uh, how would that work? The Bible is without error. Could any literature in humankind claim inerrancy? Well, the Bible claims inerrancy. We talked about that last uh, session in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. It says, every word of God is flawless. And throughout scripture, you see this, ins you know, like insistence on this is the word of God. It is the perfect, pure word of God without error. And inerrancy claims that when God spoke through the prophet or the person who wrote down his message, that it was absolutely without error error. That's what that means. And then infallibility means that the word of God is incapable of error and that it, it lasts and it endures perfectly, flawlessly, that it is incapable of being wrong. And uh, and so that's a, those are all very big statements, aren't they? They're theological terms, inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility. And what they do is they kind of set the groundwork for us to work from. So we're going to be talking about why those things are true of God's word and that's why God's word, the Bible, is it stands apart from all other written literature in human history and why it is something we can trust to build our lives upon. I want to talk a little bit about uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. I've written a few scripture verses on my easel here for you so you can copy them down if you want to. I hope you're taking notes. I hope that you're taking notes in a special notebook where you can keep it and reference it again. I was so excited to see some people uh, already who've been doing that, and I'm really encouraged about that. 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about the inspiration of Scripture. It says this. It says, 
All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So what it means is that God breathed out these words. It's just like from Exodus, uh, for, excuse me, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, and God said, right? God said something and it was, he breathed it. And that's why it's inspired, is that God breathed out these words. How did that work? Well, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 really explains it very well. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy, Peter says, never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I love that. It gives me confidence in thinking about what is in this Bible and how it got there. Uh, then Luke chapter 4, uh, Luke, excuse me, chapter 1, says this. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, Luke is going like, I'm trying to compile some history here for you. He said, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. That That's scripture, and that's how we got scripture. I think it's really cool to see, oh, that's how it all happened. God spoke through these special people that he had, he had assigned this special task, and he breathed his word and inspired it. And that is why we can trust it. Now, the Bible was written by 40 authors, and uh, you can find out more information about those authors. I'm going to give you a link in just a minute. Uh, but 40 different authors over 1,500 years of span of time. It's 66 individual books in what, what's called the canon of Scripture. I'm going to get to that in a second. And it's one message, and I love that. We're going to be talking about what's the one message in a next in a forthcoming session. But I want to um, give you a really cool link, uh, along with an amazing infographic that will really summarize all that I just said into a really just one infographic, and it's from BibleInfo.com, and it's about who wrote the Bible. So um, I want to give, I want you to find this infographic. It will blow your mind. It's so simple uh, how it's put together, but it's got all the important information on there. But that's really that's who wrote the Bible. It was God speaking through prophets and apostles coming to us as his word. Okay, so the second question about how we got the Bible is, who decided? In other words, if these uh, words were written down by apostles, and then there was some collection over time of different documents that the apostles had written down, or the prophets had written down, who decided uh, which ones got included in what we now would call the canon of scripture or the what we would consider to be the bible the whole bible and so i want to kind of talk about uh, what that looks like first of all the old testament was was really written by and compiled by uh, about 400 bc um, really there was agreement on which old testament old covenant books should be uh, all the way from Genesis to Malachi, should be included in the Old Testament Bible, what the Jews would have called the Bible, um, by about 250 BC. That was totally, you know, clear, clean. Then the New Testament was written primarily uh, by, 90, but was written, done, done by 90 AD, and with the writing of the, the Apocalypse of John, otherwise called Revelation from the New Testament, was written by 90 AD, and then over the course of the next few hundred years, there were these things called councils, which met to, to, to go like, let's, let's, you know, there was scripture circulating in the churches. As if you read these things in the New Testament, you can even see the apostles talking about this kind of activity. In fact, Peter acknowledges Paul's writings as scripture, Paul the same uh, with Peter. And so there were these four rules that these councils would use all the way from 170 AD on up into around 400 AD, when really there was agreement then on what is the canon, they call it the canon of Scripture, what's included in the New Testament. The Old Testament was already pretty well decided. What's now included in the New Testament? So we'll know what does our full Word of God look like? And um, you can see why it was like an important decision, right? I mean, I have a hard enough time sometimes asking my wife, like, where do you want to go to lunch? And it takes us forever to make those kinds of decisions. Can you imagine, like, which books should be which books are really scripture? Which books are God-breathed? How would we tell 
which books are God breathed. I mean, the apostles by then, the prophets had died. They couldn't go ask them. They had to rely on some guides. And here's the four rules that were used to determine through all these hundreds of years and all these councils, what got included in the final canon of scripture. First one was apostolic origin. It had to be written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. And so there's this apostolic authority to, uh, to this document, this writing, this letter in some cases. The second one was universal acceptance. In other words, all of the churches in all of the places all agreed these are indeed the word of God. And that's powerful to me to look at it and they, and they go, well, the character of it, it was written by an apostle. It's, you know, it's, it's moving our lives. That would be the third rule is practical impact. In other words, they used these documents, these writings, they used them in their liturgy, in their church services. Because why? Because they were powerful. They carried a power. They changed people's lives. And that was a really, really big, important factor in this is scripture. And the last one is a consistent message that they didn't, they didn't go off in different directions because um, some books were excluded. Some writings were excluded from the canon of scripture. And the reason was because they didn't have a consistent message. And so while they're still valuable writings, they don't hold that same authority that scripture does. And that's really what we're talking about when we ask the question, uh, how did we get the Bible? The, the real question we're asking is, like, how do we know that it has authority? And we can kind of look at this and go, well, I'm convinced, I'm, my confidence grows when I review these things to know it's authoritative, it makes a difference in my life, and I can trust the Bible because I know how we got it. So the third question we have about how did we get the Bible is, well, how do we get from then to now? We just talked about 400 AD, well, it's 2020. How did we get from then to now? We're just gonna kind of walk through the basics, okay? First of all, there was copying by hand. They would have a document uh, that, you know, a, a scroll really, uh, going all the way back to 90 AD when John the apostle finished the revelation. Um, it was in a scroll and these scrolls were made up of vellum or papyrus and whatever would uh, they could find, honestly, um, that was either an animal skin or reeds that were pounded together. And uh, like you might've seen some, you know, in some old, uh, old store or something like that. And so they would take, of course, uh, ink and, and write on these things. And then they would be stored in a uh, dry place. Now, this is an interesting thing. And you got to think about how God did this all because it's interesting that the Middle East is a climate where it's dry enough where documents like this last a long time. That's why in session one, I told you about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they had survived from the time of before Christ all the way till 1947 when they were discovered in, uh, in a cave in, uh, in the Middle East where the Essenes had lived and a shepherd boy was out uh, in the middle of nowhere with his sheep and he took a rock and he threw it up into this cave and he heard this crash and he knew he had he had hit something valuable so he he some people went up and looked and they discovered all these ancient scrolls that were you know 2000 years old and they had survived because of the climate that they were in isn't that fascinating how god had that all worked out that these scrolls would be preserved for a long time and that's why when we get to the session where we talk about the manuscripts that's why we have so many manuscripts of the bible compared to all other literature it's fascinating and it's and it's convicting i mean it's convincing to me to go well i really do trust the bible because of all these factors well anyways there was this hand copying that would go from one scroll scroll to another and the scribes who did this by the way were under tight supervision there was so many rules meticulous rules where they had to abide by in fact if there was even one mistake they had to write one letter at a time and then stop and compare that they wrote the, the correct letter and their supervisor would be checking these things. And if there was even one mistake in the scroll, no matter how far they had gone, they threw it away and started from the beginning. That's how meticulous the rules were for hand copying the Bible books that we now have in our Bibles. Um, and then you had the printing press in 1440, which made this a whole lot easier, made the Bible accessible. People finally had a, a Bible in their town. Can you imagine not just a Bible in your home, a Bible in your town finally, because the printing press in Gutenberg and and they were able to have the Bible accessible. The other advantage is once you set that type, the, the, the press, um, you could run the, the thing and you knew that it was already accurate. And so um, accuracy was easier at that point. So it really sped up the process of what could be done. I mean, even the printing alone, you could print 3,600 pages 
on the first printing press in a day compared to a hand copying shop being able to produce 40 pages a day. I mean, just what, what an advancement forward to get the Bible accessible. And uh, so then it was distributed all around the world. And you know, now we're really talking about as languages were being uncovered, as the world was really starting to become smaller. Um, now there's all kinds of translations starting to be available in that time frame. And um, somebody uh, pointed out that, you know, I wonder if there's some, you know, co some correlation between the wide accessibility of Scripture and the Renaissance. Interesting thought. But um, then you have in 2013, even more accessibility. The, the scholars are calling our age the most Scripture connected generation in history because the Bible app hit uh, phones in 2013. And by the end of 2017, uh, or 2018, 330 million downloads already of the, of the Bible app. I mean, just the fastest proliferation of scripture in history. And it's amazing and, it, and it's brilliant. And I love it. And this is how, you guys, this is how we got the Bible. So if it's been a mystery to you, as you kind of hold the Bible in your hand or you look at it on your phone, you go like, is this really all that special? I wanted to walk you through how we got the Bible because it, it becomes more and more uh authoritative in my life and special to me that when I start looking at it this way. Here's your homework assignment for this session. It is to memorize 2 Timothy 3.16, which says that all scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and instructing in righteousness. You can memorize it from whatever version you want to, um, but I want to encourage you to memorize that first because sometimes the, the enemy is going to come to you and make you and go, did, did God really say that? Just like he asked Adam and Eve, did God really say that? And he's going he's gonna to throw some twisted words that you like he did to Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. And he's going to go, is that really what God's word says? And you got to know that God's word can be trusted. So thank you so much for joining for session two. I can't wait to see you for session three.